Thanks everyone uh, for joining the webinar today. So as Pauling said, this is all about using AWS purpose-built databases to modernize your applications. Um, the agenda for today, what we're going to go through is how the database market is changing, how application architecture is changing, uh, look at the AWS database services and have a bit of an overview of those. Then look at some modernization paths and how you can take what you have today and what your options are uh, with a bit of a focus on relational database modernization because that's primarily what most customers have today. And then we're going to look at how easy it is to actually do database upgrades once you're in our relational database service. So we're going to do a demo of that. And then we're going to talk about migrating to AWS using the database migration service and schema conversion tool. If you're going to be looking at refactoring or re-architecting your applications, then sometimes it can be um, a bit of a chore to decide what data store you're going to use. So we're going to ha um, have a look at a couple of ways of deciding how to do that. And then we're going to go through a step-by-step -step approach of how you can modernize an application's data tier uh, and then end with a summary. So moving on to the first one, the database market is changing quite rapidly. And if you think back to the beginning of computing where there was uh, punch cards and magnetic tape, then eventually people realized that they needed to store data in a bit more of a structured way. And that's when we saw network databases and codicell databases coming into the market. And then in the 70s, uh, we had the introduction of the relational model and you saw databases like um, IBM's uh, DB2 coming into play, as well as Oracle and SQL Server, Sybase, et cetera, um, on the commercial side. And then on the open source side, you started to see Postgres and MySQL come a bit later. And those databases since you know, the uh, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, and up until today have been the mainstay of majority of application development. So relational databases have been what has given us most of our applications over the last few um, years. Now, looking at what's happened recently, and by recently I'm talking about from say around the 2010 mark, is we started to see a whole lot of different database options come out in the market. And this was around in-memory databases, uh, NoSQL databases, um, even NewSQL is a term that you may have heard. And these are databases like MongoDB, uh, React, Cassandra, uh, in-memory caches like Memcache and then Redis as well. So all of a sudden, the relational only kind of world has changed into having not only relational, but all these other options to you to build a different and more modern data architecture for applications, especially in the, the web age and the cloud age. So what has actually you know, been the traditional approach of how you build a, a database architecture or an application on top of it is you have a client tier, which would be traditionally a, a thick client, so it could be you know, a Java client or a .NET client, uh, connecting to an application or web tier, and then a database below that. And of course, the client could also be a browser. Then what you're trying to do there is say that, hey, we're going to put everything into this relational database. And it has to become this uh, massive Swiss Army knife in terms of being able to do all these different capabilities inside it and turns into a, a huge monolithic beast. And that means that inside there, you are expecting it to do key value access, uh, complex queries and transactions, analytics, uh, perhaps even graphing and so on. And that is not what we traditionally want to see as we move into cloud-based applications. So on a cloud data tier architecture, we're still going to have the clients and the application and the web tier, but we want to use the best database for each workload. So when you look at your data tier, you'll probably find that you have different types of use cases in there and that you should be using different databases for those. So if we look at something like NoSQL, well, what's best suited for that is key value and simple query. If you have a lot of hot reads that are hitting um, you know, a couple of blocks inside a relational data store or pages, then that's clearly data that perhaps you could just move out into an in-memory cache. Um, complex queries and transactions, well, that still is best handled by a relational database. And then you've got things like data warehouses for analytics, 
a blob store for logging. We still see, especially in uh, applications that were developed in the 90s and early 2000s, there's a lot of lo application logging that actually goes into the database itself. So we want to take that out. And then uh, rich search, so looking at things like searching logs or even application search is very important. So if we look at this in a bit more detail and go through each of the different types of uh, database characteristics that we see, on the relational side, what you're getting there is that strong referential integrity with strong consistency. You're getting transactions and hardened scale. So you know this is tried and tested technology. And from the Amazon side, we have Amazon Aurora and Amazon RDS. And we're going to go into each of these services a bit later, so in more detail, but we're just giving you a heads up of what's available for each of these different types of characteristics. On the key value side, this is where you've got really low latency. You just have got a key that you're going to pull back some data, and you want that to be very high throughput in terms of getting data in and out. And Amazon DynamoDB is a great solution for that. On the document side of things, where you're indexing and storing documents, and then you want to be able to query any particular property inside that document, Amazon DynamoDB also supports a document model there as well. Um, on the graph side, what we're seeing is that this is becoming more and more popular. So if you've got a lot of relations between uh, different types of data, then this can be quite hard to represent in a relational model. Uh, especially where it's recursively uh, related. And this is where we see graph databases um, coming into play. And a good example of this is something that you probably all use in terms of social media, where you've got uh, strong relationships between different people and different entities uh, as you're going through that social media graph. Now, uh, Amazon New Neptune is a new graph database that we have released recently and is available for you to solve those problems. In memory, um, what we're seeing now is that you know we really want to be able to provide super fast access to data, and we've got to do that in microsecond latency. Again, it's key-based queries, and sometimes you might have some specialized data structures that you can put in here. And we see that Amazon Elasticache for Redis and Memcache are very good for these types of workloads. Uh, finally, search. So indexing and searching semi-structured logs and data that is really where Amazon Elasticsearch service uh, comes into its own. And th this, as I mentioned, is something that we often saw inside relational databases, but is more and more being pulled out and into its own dedicated data store. So that's the, the database world changing. And what we're going to talk about now is the application architecture and how that is changing. So this slide represents microservices at Amazon in terms of how the amazon.com website uh, interacts. And you can see that there is a bunch of tiny little uh, dots on there. Some are blue, some are red. Uh, some of them are correspond to services which customers interact with and other are internal services. And all of these come together to enable you to shop on amazon.com. And these are all microservices. So it's based on the service oriented architecture concept and each of these individual microservices are single purpose and you connect through them only through APIs so there's no other way to get to them and you connect to them over HTTPS so secure HTTP connection and that's fundamentally what the microservices are all about at a very high level. Now if you're looking at how we've moved along here we can see that we've got monolithic on the left and that is still what um, a large number of people are doing today, where they're developing large executables and deploying those into production. Then um, people have been looking since uh, the late 90s and, and early 2000s about breaking up those monoliths into service oriented architecture applications, where you can see here these are coarse grained functions, often held together with something like an enterprise service bus. And then finally, the next stage is where these have been broken down even further into microservices, where they're very fine grained. Now, there's two main advantages that I see with microservices. The first one is what most people I think uh, relate to them, is being able to scale your applications much further than what you could from a monolithic perspective. And that's because each of those individual microservices can be scaled independently depending on the workload that is coming towards them. So you're not restricted by having this one executable 
that can only scale to the biggest box. You've now split that up into all these individual different components that can then scale up to the same size of those business, biggest boxes. So you've got great, a greater scalability. Now, that I think is very important, but it really is not as important as what I think the agility gains that you get from adopting microservices is. And this is that you're able to have each of these individual microservices being developed by independent teams, deciding on what makes sense for them and really accelerating their development and having full control. As long as they maintain their API, then they can make changes to the application and the technology at their own pace and deploy features whenever they like, rather than relying on this one monolithic single unit being ready for deployment. And that really accelerates uh, time to market for features and of course, hopefully increases customer satisfaction and revenue opportunities. So looking at microservices more from a, the technology side of things, it means that there's no real long-term commitment to a technology stack. If you have a monolithic environment, you've got to choose your technology stack and stick to it and everybody across the whole organization has to use it because it is that one executable. Once you get into microservices, you get into a polyglot ecosystem and a polyglot persistence. So this means that each microservice team can use whatever they like to actually implement and deploy their particular microservice. Uh, we see then that uh, one of the other kind of patterns is that databases get decomposed because we end up with a database per microservice pattern. And this doesn't necessarily lend, its well, uh, lend itself well to commercial databases where you have to pay uh, licensing fees. So you can imagine that if you had a monolithic database and then you had to break that up into microservices and you were going to use commercial databases like Oracle Database or SQL Server and you have to pay for the licensing, then we're seeing more and more interest of using open source databases because of the additional costs in this particular model. So we do um, find that this is uh, forcing some change on the way people think about modernizing their applications as well. And the last part there is it allows easy use of canary and blue green deployments. And what they mean by this is that you can trial different versions of your microservices and uh, enable that to be done quite easily. So you can see if it does have a good impact in terms of the business change that you've made. So that means the, the database market is changing. We're seeing the application architecture is changing. And then you're saying, okay, well, what does AWS have to offer given that there's all these changes uh, in terms of different data platforms and database services? So what I'm gonna do now is go through and give you a quick overview of the database services that we have uh, available on our platform. Now this diagram represents an overall kind of view of the core services. There are actually more services than what's described here, especially um, in the AI and ML side of things. But I'm gonna start from the, the bottom and then move up. So if we look at data movement, we've got the database migration service. So this allows you to migrate and move data between different databases. And we're gonna talk about that in more detail later. We've got Snowball and Snowmobile, which are physical devices that you can uh, actually order from us and then we will help you put data onto those particular devices and then retrieve them and insert them into AWS. And Snowball is like a, um, a suitcase sized device and Snowmobile is actually requires a truck to deliver it. Uh, so there's a lot of data you can do there. And then Kinesis Data Firehose and Kinesis Data Streams are all about getting data easily into AWS and processing it uh, on the network. Now, where you've got to put all this data somewhere, so moving up to the next layer on the data lake, um, what we see is S3 and Glacier. So these are our, uh, some of our storage services. And S3 is commonly where customers put their blob-based data, and Glacier is more for uh, doing backups and archiving. And then Glue is used for ETL functions and very importantly, a data catalog because you need to be able to define where the data is and what it is so that you can get hold of it again. And then Macy is a data protection service that is constantly monitoring things going on. And for example, if you leave an S3 bucket open and public, then it will tell you that you have done that to make sure that you're protecting your data and locking it away from prying eyes. Then moving up to the next side, on the left, we've got operational uh, OLTP databases. We've got DynamoDB, Neptune, Elasticash, Aurora, and RDS. Um, and we're gonna talk about these more. Um, so these are primarily databases that you would be building your traditional operational applications around. 
And then on the right-hand side, analytics, where you've got OLAP uh, and decision support. Amazon Redshift is our petabyte scale uh, MPP database for doing uh, analytics. And then EMR is our Hadoop platform. So inside that, you've got the whole ecosystem around Spark, uh, Spark Streaming, um, Presto, and so on. So that's offered as a managed service. And then Athena allows you to query data directly on S3 through a standard SQL interface without the need to provision any services or servers. So it really is quite a powerful uh, thing. You can actually uh, go and just run a query and get the results directly from the data on S3. And then you've got real time. You've got Elasticsearch Service and Kinesis Data Analytics. So Kinesis Data Analytics allows you to run SQL queries on data streaming through Kinesis. And that's really powerful for that real time results where you're trying to build things up like uh, KPI monitors and those types of things. And talking to uh, actually building up results, and then the next level up, we've got business intelligence and machine learning. So Amazon QuickSight is our visualization tool, and that allows you to build reports and stories around your data. And then machine learning behind the scenes there, we've got a whole bunch of tools uh, such as SageMaker. And then on the AI side of things, um, there are other tools as well. So that we're not going to cover off those in today's session. What we are actually going to focus on is the operational side of things. So I'm going to go through these in more detail. So Amazon RDS, the Relational Database Service, gives you a list of uh, six different databases that you choose as your kind of engine. And inside that, there are different options. So for example, Amazon Aurora uh, is our own take on MySQL and Postgres. So there's two options for you inside that. Then we do have community edition of MySQL and Postgres. We've got MariaDB, which is a database, for those of you who don't know, which is kind of a fork from MySQL, the original creators. And people who are using that are concerned about, say, Oracle's ownership of MySQL and prefer a more um, you know, true open source approach, if you like, to database software. Then on Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle side, we support uh, the major additions that they offer. So for example, with SQL Server, you can use Express, you can also use Standard Edition and Enterprise Edition, and we can provide licenses by the hour for those databases. Now, on the Oracle side of things, we can provide licenses by the hour for Standard Edition 1 and Standard Edition 2, but for Enterprise Edition, you still have to bring your own license for that. So you can still run Enterprise Edition on RDS, but you need to bring your own license. So RDS is very easy to administer. Um, it's very flexible, so you can scale a database up and down with a few clicks, and that really uh, is very hard to do on so it's quite easy to do that with RDS. It's also available and durable. So multi-AZ is our capability where we can deploy a database across two physical data centers. We will have a master in one data center and a standby in another data center. And these are kept synchronously up to date. So if something goes wrong with the master, we will automatically fail over to the standby. And because they are automatically kept up to date, there is no data loss when that failover occurs. So there will be a short outage of around 30 to 90 seconds, and then your application will be kept uh, being able to run, and you don't really have to do anything. So what would happen is, let's say, if this happened at 2 a.m., uh, you would not even know from a business perspective if it was a business hours ap uh, application. The users would come in in the morning and everything would still be running. So it's a, a very good managed service to help you with that. It's also fast because we've got dual SSD back storage for high performance OLTP. And we've got a large number of different types of instances with up to, uh, for Oracle, 128 vCPUs and four terabytes of RAM. So some very large and fast servers with good storage to help you uh, with your database performance. Amazon Aurora, as I mentioned, is our take, if you like, on creating a database that is providing the performance and availability of commercial grade databases, but for one tenth the cost. Now, performance and scalability is something that we've really worked with on this database. So you're gonna see on the same hardware at the very high end of throughput, about five times more throughput uh, compared with standard MySQL and about three times 
more throughput when compared with standard Postgres. Now, the key thing here is this is not performance, right? You're not going to be able to run a single query on your laptop and then go and run that uh, single query on Aurora MySQL and get five times the performance. This is all about throughput. So being able to on the hard, same hardware doing up to five times the amount of work. And that's a really important distinction uh, to make. So availability and durability. Another key factor here is the storage that we built with Amazon Aurora. It allows you to have six copies of your data across three availability zones, and that is continuously backed up to Amazon S3. Now S3 alone has 11 nines of durability, and then you've got six copies of the actual live data across those three availability zones. So the availability and durability components of Amazon Aurora is exceedingly high. Then it's also secure. So we've got network isolation. You don't actually have access to the storage nodes. And then on the encryption side, we can do encryption at rest and in transit. It is also fully managed, just like a standard RDS environment. Uh, the interface is also very similar to RDS. So there's no hardware provisioning. You just go ahead and uh, say, I want this type of instance, and I'm gonna have these uh, patching arrangements, and then you set everything up and the backups windows and maintenance windows are all provisioned for you. Now on Amazon DynamoDB, so this is our NoSQL service. What we're looking at here is a tier zero service for AWS and Amazon. Uh, Amazon depends heavily on DynamoDB to run the .com website as well as AWS itself. So this is super important to us and therefore is something that you can depend on for business critical applications. It is also highly scalable. A single table can serve millions of requests per second and we can store hundreds of terabytes of data. You also get really good consistent performance and you can speed that up by adding a cache in front of DynamoDB as well and that's built into the product now through what we call DynamoDB Accelerator or DAX. It's fully managed. It really is very simple to use. You simply specify a table and how many reads and writes you would like with that. Um, you can also let it auto scale, which is something that was added recently. So talking about features that we have added recently for DynamoDB, uh, going back to last year in February, uh, time to live. This is really important because there was a lot of customers who were ingesting data into DynamoDB and then they didn't really need it after a period of time. So now we automatically go and delete that data for them. Previously, uh, as you would have known, if you've used it, you would have to actually pay for that deletion operation. With uh, TTL, you actually don't have to pay for that. It just happens in the background. So that's a, a great addition. With VPC endpoints, you now don't have to go across the public internet to access the DynamoDB endpoints. And then DynamoDB Accelerator or DAC, as I mentioned, is a cache that is in front of DynamoDB to give you that microsecond response time. And it is a write-through cache. So if you're writing, you're still going to go back to DynamoDB to make sure the data is persisted. But if you're reading, you're reading directly from the cache. You don't need to go back to DynamoDB. With auto-scaling, what you can do is set some limits so you don't spend too much money. And then DynamoDB will auto-scale uh, from the minimum and maximum that you've provided. We also last year introduced global tables, and this allows you to have multi-master applications where you're going to have, let's say, in a Singapore region and then in the Mumbai region, uh, a single table view where you can read and write to that across both regions. So if you're deploying globally and you want to have consistent data across these different regions, then DynamoDB allows you to do global tables. On November, we also uh, announce backup and restore. So even though DynamoDB is stored across three different facilities, we now have introduced a backup and restore to allow you to um, manage a production environment and restore it, uh, create copies of it, and so on. And then finally, in February, we introduced encryption at rest. And this was really important for uh, regulated environments such as uh, financial institutions, government, uh, and telcos, etc. Looking at Amazon Neptune, so this is our fully managed graph database. It is fast. You can query billions of relationships with a millisecond latency. It also uh, adopts the same model as Amazon Aurora with six replicas of your data across three availabilities, uh, availability zones. 
with full backup and restore. It's powerful to, um, it, you can build powerful queries with Gremlin and the Sparkle query languages. And these are some of the common and uh, you know, easy to use languages to create graph-based queries. And it also is very open. It supports Apache Tinkerpop and the W3C RDF graph models. So you can really you know, keep the data in a fairly open format and bring that between different systems if you wish. Now, some people go you know, and say, well, what is this graph stuff and, and what are some of the different uh, scenarios that we can use graph for? Well, as I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, a social news feed or a social network is a very uh, graph-based model where you have friends you're related to who are also liking things and whether your friends like something might be more important to you versus somebody else who's like something. So there's all these kind of different relationships in a social network that can be represented by a graph. Also on restaurant, restaurant recommendations, um, if you have friends who like particular things and you can trust those friends, uh, um, then you may find that you want to get recommendations more uh, favored from your friends rather than strangers again. And that can help from a graph model to represent and weight the uh, recommendations based on those types of um, algorithms. And then something that we're seeing quite a lot of adoption of is around fraud detection, whether it's in retail or banking uh, or other industries. And if you look at the different attributes that are on this particular slide, you've got a person who has a phone, a credit card, an address, an IP, and an email address. And then you can correlate that to an order. And if you see start, start seeing anomalies where perhaps this is being used uh, perhaps for this transaction from a different phone, then that might give you a, a score of, of something that you can calculate. And then if it's from a different IP, then that could probably um, give you, you know, a, a, another kind of point of difference. And you could start to say, well, from a scoring perspective, that there's going to be some high probability of fraud when these things differ too much over time. And that is something that we're really seeing a strong usage model in the graph database world with Amazon Neptune. With Elasticash, what we're seeing here is a fully managed service for Redis or Memcache. And this is all about in-memory data stores or caching. So we really want to use this for extreme performance where you're getting sub millisecond response times and it's secure and hardened. So you've got your VPC endpoints so that you've got cluster isolation, you've got encryption at rest and in, tra in transit. And like many of the other services, there, there are different compliances that we have. And HIPAA is uh, mentioned here. It's also available on most of our other services as is PCI and others. Also very scalable. So you, you can now do read scaling with replicas and you can do sharding and have clusters and so on. So a lot of flexibility in how you deploy. And then multi-AZ for Redis, where we can have a master with read replicas. And if something goes wrong, we can fail over to those read replicas. So where we see these types of in-memory data stores and caches being used is really uh, when you are scaling up applications to above and beyond what a relational database can do. And you know this has definitely been where we've seen problems um, with gaming where gaming leaderboards are being hit all of the time. And if you keep going back to a relational database, that can put heavy load on that. So if you can offload that and put that into a cache, you can protect your uh, database at the back end. And if you're not needing as many cores of your database, th then that can actually reduce cost, especially if it is a commercial database, uh, like say Microsoft SQL Server, where you pay per individual core. So this allows customers to scale their applications and to reduce costs. And what we're seeing is that some customers can really use this to great advantage. So Grab, which is a ride hailing company based out of Singapore and focusing on Southeast Asia, uses Elasticash heavily for their uh, application. And whether you're using it in uh, the Philippines or in Indonesia or Singapore, et cetera, uh, you are depending on Elasticash to deliver those ride hailing services. So now that you've understood that the database market is changing, the application architecture is changing, and we've got all of these different services in AWS that you can use, you need to start deciding, well, what 
are my modernization parts? How can I take my applications I have today and what do I actually do with them? So this next slide is called the six R's of migration planning. And you may have seen it on other AWS presentations as well. So let's go through the different options here. So the first thing that you will have to do, and this is especially relevant for enterprise customers that have a large fleet of databases and applications, you need to go through and discover, uh, assess, and prioritize what you're going to do with uh, particular applications. And then you're gonna to have to decide, do you uh, retain those or retire them? And in which case there's not much modernization to do. Um, but the other options all have different aspects in, term of, in terms of modernization. So the first one is rehost. That is just what we call lift and shift. So you're gonna take what you have and move that into AWS. So at that point, you're really not modernizing anything. You're just taking what you have, putting it on uh, new hardware. So perhaps you're getting modernization from a hardware perspective, but not the application side of things. On the re-platform side, that's where you can look at perhaps a new operating system, changing the operating system uh, version, upgrading the database to a later version, perhaps changing the database. And then the next one is repurchase. So this could be you have a packaged application and what you're going to do is go and buy a SaaS version of that that perhaps operates out of AWS, or maybe you're going to get the next version and upgrade that, modernize it, and then deploy that into AWS. And then finally, the last one there is the re-architect and refactor. So this is where you get the opportunity to look at your existing application and say, well, this really needs to be modernized. We need to add some different components and capabilities to this. It's no longer meeting business requirements. And that's where you get a chance to either completely rewrite it or perhaps break up some components and modernize some components of that application. But this is really a good example of the different options that you have. Now, one of the most common decision points you have to look at for most customers is that relational databases need to be modernized. And uh, most applications, of course, as I mentioned, are still using relational databases. So there are a number of concerns coming up for different Oracle databases, SQL Server databases, as well as MySQL and Postgres. And this is all about keeping software current and making sure things are modern. So Oracle 11G R2 requires additional extended support contracts and additional fees from January 1, 2019, with support ending on December 31st, 2020. So Oracle um, kindly waived some of the extended support fees for uh, 11G R2 for the last couple of years. And uh, unfortunately, they are going to charge for that from January 1. So if you've got uh, Oracle databases on 11G R2, you will have to start paying additional support for that. With Microsoft SQL Server 2008 and 2008 R2, they are already in extended support with the support ending on July 9, 2019. Microsoft um, uh, can be run um, in AWS. In fact, we're one of the only platforms that actually allows you to deploy 32-bit applications in the AWS platform. So that can really help with some of these older applications, at least give you some time to decide how you are going to modernize those by deploying them on AWS. With MySQL 5.5, the support ends on December 2018. And then Postgres 9.3 support actually just ended in September 2018. So with the RDS uh, Postgres, we've just been through a uh, de-support where we've had to get customers to upgrade to the next or later editions of Postgres. And that is something that we do do on the RDS environment because we need to make sure that we can continue to provide security patches and other fixes for our customers and protect the overall fleet. So if you still want to run some of these older or unsupported environments, you can do that definitely on AWS, but you have to do that in EC2, not on RDS. So what are your options once you decide, well, yes, we definitely need to do the upgrading. Um, how are we going to tackle this and get rid of these uh, databases that are now going to be end of life? Well, you can upgrade on-prem and keep things on-prem if you like, um, but you can also do a new option on-prem and that is upgrade on-prem with Amazon RDS on VMware. This is something that was just announced uh, with VMware recently. It's not available today, but it will be available soon. Uh, but allows you to run the RDS environment on-premise with VMware. 
You can also choose to migrate to AWS on VMware and then upgrade, or migrate to EC2 and RDS and then do the upgrade there, or you can migrate directly to a later version in AWS, whether it's on EC2 or RDS or whatever. You could also decide to migrate to another database. So for example, you could go from Oracle to MySQL. And if it's on RDS, you could use the, the single click upgrade option, which I'm going to show you now. So imagine what you have to do when you're actually going to go through an upgrade of say an Oracle database. It's quite an involved process that requires a lot of testing and takes a, a long time. So to help you do that, I'm going to show you now how we do that inside the AWS. So this is the RDS interface, and I've got a couple of databases here. The Upgrade Me one is the one I'm going to choose today. So this is Oracle 11.2.0.4. The V16 just is our internal versioning. That includes different patches and PSUs that have been applied, et cetera. And then on the DB instance class, it's an R4.2XL. So what we're going to do here is just modify this instance. So we'll click on that. And then down here, we're simply going to go to this drop down and then choose the next version of Oracle that's available and get the latest version, so the default. And that's all we're going to change, just that one click to go and select that. And then we go down to the bottom and we want to continue. And then the modification here, you see, moving from this particular version to this one, changing some parameter groups. And then the key point you need to do here is this says apply during the next scheduled maintenance window. Um, we don't want that. We want to apply immediately. But if you did have a maintenance window you wanted to adhere to, then you just keep to that. Now, notice there's a, a potential unexpected downtime. If you had other things that were going to happen in your scheduled maintenance window, when you click apply immediately, those things will also get done. So for example, maybe you allocated another 100 gig of storage to the database that was going to happen in the maintenance window. That would now happen at this time as well. So I click modify database instance, and then that's now going to be upgrading. So if I go back to to the database list, you can see that this is now upgrading. Now we'll come back at the end, but I, I think this is gonna to take too long. It takes, I think, about half an hour, so we're probably not gonna quite make it for the actual um, webinar period, but I conveniently do have another one I did last night, and I can show you how long that takes looking at the logs when we come back. So, once you've decided that, okay, we do want to actually migrate some of these databases to AWS, how do you go about doing that? Well, we need to use the AWS database migration service. So this is all about moving data between different databases. So the databases that are listed down below, some of these are sources and targets. Some of them are targets only, and some of them are sources only. So for example, DynamoDB, is at the moment a target only. Uh, MongoDB is a source only. And uh, other databases like Postgres, Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server, uh, Aurora, MariaDB, et cetera, they are actually available as sources and targets. Now I have included Cassandra on this slide, but Cassandra is actually a combination of using the schema conversion tool and DMS today. But I just wanted to highlight it as one of the databases that we do support. So this is the database migration service, and then we do have the schema conversion tool. So why do we need these different tools? Well, as I mentioned, the database migration service is all about moving the data. Now, the schema conversion tool is all about moving the database definitions themselves. So the code around the store procedures, the triggers, the table definitions and data types and all these types of things. So we support migration of different databases to the open source engines and on the data warehouse side to Amazon Redshift. Now, um, you can get quite good conversion rates even from say Oracle databases with quite a bit of PL SQL in there. And we are continuing to improve the tool and improve the conversion rates as we go along as well. So if you did look at this, say, a year ago and you weren't happy with the conversion results, please do have a look at it again and evaluate it and see what has changed. So how you use these tools together. 
First, you would either convert or copy your schema with say a native tool or the schema conversion tool. Um, copying is all about taking something that perhaps you don't have the schema um, creation scripts for say an old Oracle database, and then you just need to copy from the production system to a new database. Once that's been done, you've got a new database with an empty schema. So you've got the table definitions, the foreign key constraints, the um, primary key constraints, the triggers, store procedures, all of that stuff's defined, but there's no data. So at that point, you then need to move your data user using either DMS, if it's a standard database, and the way DMS works is it's going to keep transmitting that data while your production application is running. And that allows you then, once it's all caught up, to switch over with minimal downtime. So it's using change data uh, capture technology to do the migration. And then you may want to migrate a data warehouse and the schema conversion tool allows you to do that in a much more efficient way for large data sets by taking data into text files, putting that on S3 and then loading it into Amazon Redshift. Now we do have NoSQL support, as I mentioned. So MongoDB is supported to go to DynamoDB or to RDS. And Cassandra, by default, will just be supported through the automated way uh, from using the schema conversion tool and DMS to DynamoDB. But if you're prepared to do some manual tasks, then you can actually take Cassandra data to uh, relational data with DMS as well. Now, some people want to move between, uh, you say, relational databases to NoSQL. So we also support taking data from a relational format into DynamoDB as well. And this is a really interesting feature. So more and more customers are looking to build data lakes and putting that data into S3 as the data repository. So we now support putting data from operational data stores into S3 continuously. So as the applications are updating the data in say a Postgres or Oracle database, that is constantly being streamed into S3. We can also take data that is being streamed into S3 and then propagate that to databases using DMS as well. So this becomes a very powerful way to start building out that data lake strategy, but using uh, integration technologies, using change data capture with the DMS product. Now, one of the great things that the schema conversion tool does is it allows you to, to look at how hard a migration is going to be. So it does this by assessing the schema, and what it will do is look at the database objects, so the tables and the constraints and indexes, et cetera, and that will tell you how hard it's going to be to migrate those. Then it will also look at the code objects, so the triggers and the store procedures, and tell you how complicated those are. So you get a nice graph view of how complicated the migration will be. And then on the right-hand side of this slide, you'll see that we also list out all of the individual things that we found that are going to be be a problem as part of the migration. And then you can go through this report and work out, is this something that you're going to be able to um, fix or is this something that is going to be so inherent to the application that it doesn't make sense to do a migration? And that's what this tool is all about. So you don't actually have to go and do the migration to figure out whether it's feasible or not. So we've had more than 90,000 databases migrated with DMS so far. And as you can see here from the customers, they are customers from all different types of countries and backgrounds, industries, et cetera, and um, all having success with the database migration service to migrate their databases. So now we've covered you know, the different ways that you would look at bringing, bringing existing applications into AWS. But what about if you were going to refactor or re-architect the application and then you have to decide, well, what are the data stores that you're going to use and how do you decide that? Well, many problems can be solved with NoSQL, a relational database, or even in memory cache technology. So you could use any of those to solve common problems. So what we tend to go and use is non-functional requirements that can help identify appropriate services. And what we ask customers to do is classify your organization's non-functional requirements and map them to service capability. So we're going to go through and show you how to do that. So here is a list of non-functional requirements, things like latency, durability, storage scale, availability, etc. Now, these are only an example, right? You may have many more different requirements and your classifications could very well and should be different than what we're saying here. So please don't take this slide and say, 
Blair said that this is what we need to do. Uh, it's really a guideline. And there will be other requirements such as regulatory compliance as well. So we really need to, to look at this as a guideline and build out your own. But it, it's a, a good example of the approach. So you may find that, for example, a particular application could have very high latency requirements of less than 20 milliseconds, but the storage scale could be very low of less than 256 gigabytes. So for each application, you need to go through here and decide what makes more sense for your particular environment. And once you've done that, and then you can actually map these requirements to our services. So here you can see that I've listed out some of the services and then mapped out what their capabilities are on this particular slide. Now I've just noticed uh, an error which I'm going to have to fix on here, but RDS, the storage is actually 16 terabytes now for all engines, not just uh, SQL Server. So that's something uh, that I need to fix. But fundamentally what we've done here is list out these services. We've also combined some services. So Aurora plus Elasticash, that actually allows you to combine two services to get a better latency requirement for your particular application. When you've done this, this should hopefully then shorten the amount of services that you have that meet your non-functional requirements. And then you can start applying functional requirements such as geospatial data and query support, and that'll help you refine that list further. So for example, if you do find that, hey, we could use Aurora MySQL or Aurora Postgres, uh, which one should we do? And then you start getting to the geospatial data requirements. Then Postgres has got a really great implementation around PostGIS, and that is highly regarded in the industry. So I would then favor going to Postgres if both MySQL and uh, uh, Postgres meet your functional, uh, sorry, non functional requirements. You then may look at instituting standards, uh, especially when you're into uh, microservice development. So make sure it's easier for people to move between those teams. So for example, if you have a microservice team which is focused on .NET with SQL Server, and then another one which is perhaps using say Java with Postgres, well then the people on those teams are not necessarily gonna be able to move across and help each other out if they only know those particular skills. So in a large organization, you might try and standardize some of those developments, but fundamentally you should still allow them to be overridden where it is justified. And that's where we see that senior management um, can have a process in place where you can apply to use a different technology and then get that approved where it makes sense. Now, looking at modernizing an application data tier step by step, what we've done here is taken an actual customer example, and this is from a gaming customer, and shown the steps that they did to take a fairly stock standard application and add different components to their data tier to help that application scale and modernize it as their requirements changed. So looking at this diagram here, we have got a fairly standard application where it's got a user at the top who's receiving DNS information from Amazon Route 53 and then getting CloudFront data that's cached at the edge from Amazon S3. And when they need to access the application components, it goes into EC2 with an auto scaling group. And then below that, you've got a master instance running on RDS with a standby in another availability zone. So this is a stock standard environment. And in this case, it was actually a LAMP stack. Now, what the customer wanted to do was to make sure they could scale this application so they started to introduce read replicas, and this allowed them to get you know, some way forward and scale to more users. But fundamentally what would happen is that the marketing department would send out a lot of invites for promotions for this particular game, and then they would get a logon storm. So if you analyze your data tier and find out where are the problems, what you're gonna find is that, that there are gonna be components that get a lot of activity. And of course, if it's a lot of users coming on creating a logon storm, then you can take that component and put that into something else. So in this in this uh, example, what they did is they took out the user management and logon system and put that into DynamoDB. And because DynamoDB can scale infinitely, then what they're able to do is take that load off the relational system and protect the relational database that couldn't handle that before. And then they were able to uh, able to get better performance and scale for their game and better results for their customers. They then also added 
uh, memcache for session management so that they could have that quickly available with in-memory performance and again taking more load off the relational database and then for leaderboards they changed to Redis so this Redis um, actually has a capability called ordered sets which is fantastic for things like leaderboards which of course have to be ordered by scores and rankings and therefore what they're able to do is to use Redis to automatically keep those leaderboards up to date and retrieve them as ordered sets. Now you would have noticed that I also changed down the bottom a uh, database here which has moved from a standard RDS instance to Aurora and I've removed the standby and just have a re-replica there. And the reason for that is that Aurora does not need a standby database that's just sitting there not doing anything waiting for a failover event we actually fail over to the read replica. So that gives you a cost saving by using Amazon Aurora at scale. Then on the far right, Amazon Redshift has been introduced where you can now do analytics, again, taking more load off the relational database and allowing you to do that deep analytics on a database which is designed to do that. So taking it further, what are some of the things you would do to even modernize your applications? Well, the first thing, as we've mentioned a few times, is adopt microservices. And that is something that you don't have to do completely. You can actually have a journey on that where you start to take components which clearly need the flexibility uh, and the independent scalability that microservices give you and start working on those first. And indeed, if you were to look at other customers and there's plenty of examples on, for example, YouTube recordings of customers who've described their journey. They will often start with a monolith and start picking off different components until that monolith becomes an empty shell and then they are completely transitioned to a microservices environment. So that is something that you could definitely look at. The other thing is looking at uh, containers. So especially once things are into microservices, you can then have containers for those microservices with Amazon Elastic Container Service. Amazon Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes, and then AWS Fargate as well. Um, moving beyond uh, microservices and containers and so on, you could start looking at serverless. And we have AWS Lambda where you can deploy serverless functions, and then AWS Batch to do batch jobs, step functions, which allow you to build up business functionality with a series of Lambda functions, and then Amazon Aurora MySQL serverless. So what this is, is actually a serverless database. You simply create a database and we will scale up behind the scenes the size of the instance needed to run that MySQL database. It will go up and down depending on the demand. And especially for dev test databases, it will even um, go back to just having storage and, and removing the instance completely when you're not using that dev test environment. So especially for dev test environments, environments that are only used during the day and not used at night or over the weekends, that's a great way to get some significant uh, savings. Now, looking at what you could do beyond that, you can also start integrating new functionality for IoT, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, mobile, uh, assisted reality and virtual reality, and then media integration and processing uh, like transcoding, for example. And all of these can be done through managed AWS services. So looking at the summary, remember we've gone through and we have talked about the database market is changing. We've had, uh, um, you know, gone from punch cards and magnetic tapes all the way through from Codasol network databases into the relational realm. And now we've got all these other databases in uh, NoSQL, NewSQL, caches, and so on that, that allow you to have much more variety about how you create your data tier in your application. And then application architecture is also changing. Remember, we talked about going from a monolithic environment to SOA and then adopting microservices and how microservices can have that independent data tier associated with them so that you can choose what database you want with those particular microservices. That means that relational databases are not the best solutions for all workloads. Um, you know, as I mentioned, we're still seeing databases, uh, databases that have heavy logging associated with applications that when we remove that and modernize that and then put that logging into something like Elasticsearch with a Kibana front end, it can really take a massive load and extend the life of those relational systems. 
and then allow you to start modernizing the overall architecture as well. Um, so what we want you to do is to choose the best database or data store for the job at hand. You know, it could be that you have data in the database today that doesn't even need to be in a relational system at all. It could be, or even NoSQL for that matter, it could simply be some data. Um, it could be a JSON object. It could be even an image uh, that could be just put into S3. And then that could be served out to your users uh, through CloudFront. So there's no need for that to be stored in a traditional database at all. And as you've hopefully seen from what we presented today, AWS has a comprehensive data management platform that enables you to modernize your applications, whether you're looking at deploying new different data databases for solving different problems, like Amazon Neptune for Graph, or using the tools to actually get data in and out and do migrations as well. We do have the things to help you achieve those particular goals. So just a reminder of that platform. Um, remember that we did concentrate primarily on the operational OLTP databases, DynamoDB, Neptune, Elasticash, Aurora, and RDS, but there are plenty of other data-related services that you can look at from AWS to build out your solutions. So I would uh, advise you to, if you want to know more, to go to our website and to look for our database and data-related services to find out more about the things that we did not discuss today. And if we uh, you know, want to go and learn more about AWS, there is a library of free courses online with AWS Digital Training, and there is a whole bunch of physical in-class training that you can go and attend as well. Now, before I get to the last slide, I'm just gonna jump out of the presentation and go back to the demo. And what we can see here is this is probably still gonna be upgrading. So we'll just click on this and see where we're at. Yes, it is still upgrading, but I'll show you what's happening down the bottom here. You can see what's going on. So we can see here that we started this at uh, quarter to four. I'm in Singapore, so that is the, uh, the time when we started that. And what's happening is we've backed up the database. We've had a couple of shutdowns as it's been doing the upgrade process. So let me go to the other one, which I did last night, and show you just how long that took to do that upgrade. Now, this is one is a slightly different one. It's a slightly small server. Um, it is now on version 12 of Oracle, and it is a multi-AZ database. So this has got two servers. So you can see here, it is multi-AZ. And if I go down the bottom, you can see that last night I was working uh, a bit late and uh, I kicked off this at um, uh, seven minutes to 11. And then you can see if we go back up here that it was patched and then it was starting to be backed up. But basically it was ready at this time. So 27-ish minutes to do a full upgrade from uh, Oracle 11G R2 to Oracle 12C. Now imagine how long that would take you to do on-prem, let alone provision or even buy the hardware to provision before you are able to do that. So that's something that is um, very, very compelling once you're in the RDS environment to help keep your databases modernized and up to date by being able to use RDS to do the migrations for you. So let me go back to the slides and the last thing I would like to mention is that please uh, fill in the uh, uh, survey and do remember that we will be sending out the slides for you. And thank you very much for attending this webinar and I look forward to talking to you next time.